Today I came here to tell you a story. And like all great legends of our generation, our story starts with a company. Uh, the company that you, our story's hero, decided to join. And being a high-level functional programmer slash wizard and this company's tech lead, you decided to build this company's product using a functional language. Soon enough, magic started to happen because you moved fast and you never broke anything because functional programming is awesome that way. Soon came the time when you wanted to, to, uh, to take on bigger, more challenging tasks. And even though you are a rock star, a ninja, a guru, a handsome motherfucker, all wrapped together in one lean, mean development machine, you couldn't do any, everything by yourself. So you wanted to bring on additional uh, members to your team to help you complete the task. You thought to yourself, well, maybe they can all be as awesome as me. Maybe they can all have fighting and singing and programming skills like mine. So you published a job description, but nobody came. Because as it turns out, developers who are fluent in the specific programming language you chose for your product simply cannot be found out there in the wild. It's OK, you thought to yourself. Um, I'm going to get someone with great basic stats, and I'm going to set them on the path to become a functional master. So you chose someone uh, with a lot of experience, and that experience may be with object-oriented programming languages, and that person may be going to sleep every night with their copy of Gang of Four tucked beneath their pillow. But they have a lot of self-learning experience. They've demonstrated their self-learning uh, ability, and that's bound to be enough, right? They have experience. You don't have to train them. You can simply give them a job, and they will learn. <clears throat> Little did you know that you've just made your first step on the path to the slow and painful deterioration of your code base. Because what happens when you give an experienced developer a task? They try to dive headfirst into the code. But when was the last time you tried to read code that was written in an unfamiliar development paradigm? This, does not, this just does not happen, okay? You cannot understand what's written in the code. What you expected them to do was maybe go online, uh, watch some uh, tutorials, watch some, some pre presentations, read the book, learn the language to your complete satisfaction, and then do the task. But nobody ever reads the fucking manual. So you were busy, right? Magicking, moving fast, not breaking things. Maybe you didn't have as much time to help them uh, as you would have wanted. So instead, they consulted the Oracle. <laughs> of questionable answers. And after consulting the Oracle, they managed to do something, OK? And maybe the code wasn't written exactly like you would have preferred it to do, but it worked. And for the time being, it was good enough. And things continued in that matter for some time until one day you finally had the time to give them some feedback in the form of a code review. But when you tried to do that, you found that they were not as open to feedback anymore as they were at the beginning of their way. Because they've been doing things their way for a while now, right? Uh, they're invested in their own way of doing things, and their code works. They're kind of an expert now, right? So who are you to tell them how to write code? And so, a lot of tension developed in the company because now you have Codebase, which is a patchwork of different programming styles, and you can't give them feedback because there's a lot of tension around that and they're not open to feedback, and things are just not working. So where did it all go wrong? Well, there's an obvious answer for that, and the answer is that your game plan sucked. And don't feel too, too bad. A lot of people make these mistakes. We did it, we did it as well. Uh, I was a CTO of a company called Hello Heart, and when we started, we decided to write our server code in Scala. And we had a lot of good reasons. We love Scala, we love the type system, it's fun to work with, um, it works with uh, Java, 
a lot of magic there. But one of our uh, biggest and most valid concerns, uh, in hindsight, was how we were going to hire uh, qualified developers for this position. And we thought, OK, it's going to be OK. We were just going to throw experienced developers at the, pro at the problem. We just hired experienced people. We told them, OK, this is the server code. You need to learn Scala along with your other tasks in the company. And then here is your production feature that you need to implement. Be at it. Um, but as it turned out, none of the developers who are supposed to learn that way ever managed to complete their task. And over time, what we got was a code base that was half functional and half something else. And when I talk to other companies, to other people from other companies, you can talk to a company, um, I hear a lot of similar stories. So the stories may not be as extreme as people not completing their training at all, but they may take months, months to train, right? Um, there may be a problem with knowledge transfer. They may not understand why things are done the way they are. Um, people may not learn all the concepts they need. And there may be a lot of tension around feedback and around how we do things in the company. So in my experience, these issues can be resolved by thinking about the way you onboard developers into your company. Because training programs are kind of like tutorials for your company, if you think about it. They allow people to get into things in a low risk and controlled way. And they make good use of the time where they're still malleable and open to feedback and willing to hear your ideas about how software should be written. Uh, they don't leave much to chance. Once, you complete some, once someone completes the, their training, you know what you can expect of this developer. And they create a good platform of shared knowledge and shared language around software development, around tools, around concepts that you can use. But a lot of people dread the task of building these programs because they're really easy to get wrong. Now, the first obvious way to kill your training program is by not having one. And if you think about it, this is a really silly mistake to make, right? Because knowledge transfer and development culture are two of the most important aspects of software development in your company. And when you don't have a training program, what you're doing is leaving these aspects in the hands of the people who are least capable of handling them. And think about it. Would you leave your production environment in the hands of the uh, intern who just walked into the door? Obviously, no. And yet, when it comes to training program, when it comes to our knowledge, when it comes to our culture, everybody does that. So <clears throat> this is really silly. Another problem is neglecting to teach values and culture. And what do I mean when I say values and culture? I'll explain because I repeat that a lot. I like to give an example from politics because there it's really clear. Like, what's the difference between left and right? Let's talk about peace. Yes, if you take two people, every two people in, in this room will agree that there should be peace. But once you ask people, OK, what's the meaning of peace? And what are the prices we should pay from, for it? You suddenly start to notice the differences between people's wo worldviews. And software development is kind of the same, right? We all agree that software should be extensible. But what does it mean to be extensible? Well, I heard some people say that extensible code is code that you can add functionality to without modifying existing, uh, existing uh, social design. And I know how silly that sounds, but it used to be a common way of thinking about software development back in the year 2000. And if you talk to people today, you may hear a different uh, story. So extensible code is code that is easy to change, a code that is malleable. Those are two different really different ways to get extensible code. And they both come with an associated worldview, concepts, and tools that go with them. Because if I believe that code should not be modified after it's written, maybe I should spend a lot of time on design in order to consider all the way I may want to extend my code in the future and incorp incorporate them into the design. But if I believe that uh, source code should be malleable and that it should be changed often, then I will not spend so much time on design, because it doesn't matter, because it's going to be changed soon anyway. But I will want to spend more time writing tests, so that when I change my code, uh, I make sure I don't break anything. Um, and functional programming is its own worldview, with its own 
associated way of doing things. And there are reasons why you do things the way you do them when you write functional programs. For example, why do you prefer immutable data structures? Why do you prefer to minimize side effects? There are reasons for that in the context of uh, functional programming, because it's harder to follow when you pass functions and blocks around, right? Um, how does that decision affect your design? How does that affect the testability of your code? So everything is related. And we are often not explicit about these things when we train and when we teach and when we talk to other people. So we kind of expect them to absorb them by osmosis from the environment after being functional programmers long enough and make all the connections. But what happens along the way is that you often find people having discussions about particular practices and about particular tools and arguing about them without realizing that their different opinions exist in a bigger context when each one of them makes sense. Next is trying to save time. So two obvious ways to save time by not having a training program or by giving your trainees production tasks. And there are some very good reasons to give people production tasks on their first day on the, first day on the job. Uh, one of them is uh, satisfaction, right? It's really satisfying to release a production feature, and it makes you feel like you're part of the team. But what happens when you give people production tasks? From their point of view, they are new in your team, right? They have to prove themselves to you. Uh, they want to show you how good they are, and they need to impress you. And their way of doing that is to deliver. So new people on your team are likely to prioritize delivery over quality learning and probably also uh, quality execution because they don't know what quality execution looks like. And then you put them in the position of having to defend whatever it is they did on their first days on the job later on because they don't want to seem like they did a bad job, right? They have to defend it. Um, and this is what happened to us. So people always think about, often talk about Scala as a gateway drug to functional programming because it combines both functional and object-oriented concepts. So the marketing materials will say, okay, learn Scala, it's gonna be easy because you know object-oriented programming and you know imperative programming and you will be really productive really fast and then you can take on the functional part slowly later, right? But Let's put aside the fact that this is a stupid idea because then your code base is a mess, but let's say, <laughs> let's say that, that that wasn't the case. Um, we found that often what happens under these conditions is that people learn only enough Scala in order to complete their job and then neglect the functional part altogether. And then when you try to talk to them about functional programming, they resist these concepts because they don't need them to get the job done. They completed a task, right? Why are you burdening them with all this abstract stuff and you know, computer science theory? Makes no sense. Not setting expectations. So if giving your uh, employees production tasks on their first day sets the ex expectation that they deliver, Having a training program sets the expectation that they learn, and that they learn in a quality way. And you should also set the, set the expectation about what they should learn. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is saying, okay, you should learn Scala. But, you know, Scala is a big language, and the, do, does a, a new hire need to know all the language in order to get productive? Probably not, right? Probably they don't need to know how to write macros in Scala. Uh, on their first month on the job. But is it enough to learn, I don't know, only loops and variables and array? Probably not either. And you are in the position to say what they need to, to learn. So you should be explicit about it and set the expectation. You should also set the expectations about the resources. So what, they can, uh, what kind of uh, courses and stuff they can purchase, but also who are the people in the company that they need to talk to. Because if you're the wizard and you don't have time for them to talk to them, then they're not going to ask you questions and they're going to decide all by themselves how things should be done, which is not the good thing. Uh, you need to be available to them and this stuff should be prioritized as part of your workload. Um, this is an interesting point. So failing to connect to the real world. Most companies uh, who are past a certain point in their lifetime have a hot mess of a code base, right? Who has a hot mess of a code base? We do. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then there's the question of how do you train people to deal with that code base? Because we have the old code that was written before we knew what's the right way to do things. And we don't do it anymore. It's, it's a bad way to do it. Maybe we had some good reasons to do things that way. Maybe the reason was we didn't know any better. And we have the new code, which is what we want to train people to do, but they will have to maintain the old code, so they need to know like, what's going on there. And I say, this is excellent. This is exactly the kind of stuff that you want to put in your training program, because the internet is filled with articles about writing lambda expression in whatever language it is you are developing. But what sets apart a junior developer from a senior developer in your company and in anywhere is that kind of knowledge, the kind of knowledge on how to solve uh, certain kinds of problems. What works? What doesn't work? Why doesn't it work? So you need, you need to put all this stuff in your training program. And it's also very important because this is one of the, the things that really get lost on knowledge transfer when people leave the company. Have you ever had the experience of opening a code base that was written by um, people a long time ago and telling to yourself, oh my god, the person who wrote that code, he must have been an idiot. So, <laughs> yeah. so I, had, I had that experience. And when I was uh, younger and, uh, uh, I don't know, younger, I, <laughs> I used to think that people who came before me were idiots. And then over time, I found out that A, a lot of the time they had good reasons for that, what they did. Uh, B, right now I'm other people's idiot. So I have to stand up for all of us uh, idiots. And this is all the, 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 the knowledge that gets lost when a project gets old. So it should be part of your training program. <clears throat> Uh, perfectionism. Oh my God, I f do you know how many times I fixed that? <laughs> so, um, why have a training program? Why, why have a training program if, my, if I can't train my developers to be experts? Okay? And this opinion's evil twin brother. I must train all my developers to be experts. Obviously, okay, clearly, those are not useful opinions. Those are no, not useful ways to approach training. Don't go around trying to teach your new hires category theory on the first day on the job, okay? And the last one, not least. So dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> this is the point in the TED presentation when the crowd goes, inspirational. <laughs> I also left in this cheesiest background I could find for generic presentation templates online, like it said, for big impact, a big image. Um, but I do have a point I want to get across. So who studied in the university? Everyone. Amazing. How surprising in a functional programming convention. I'm shocked. So <laughs> we all studied in the university, and I was so excited when I started my studies because <laughs> I told myself, Ila, you're going to study with the greatest minds of our generation, right? It was, amaz it, it, it was amazing. And imagine how disappointed I was when I found out <laughs> that often the best researchers, the most uh, famous researchers, are not very good teachers. And that most of the time, I learned more from the teaching assist assistants than I did from my professors. Now, I spent some time thinking about it. Why is that the case? And I came to the conclusion that people who are really good at what they're doing, they often exist on like a separate level of understanding uh, from us mere mortals and people who've just entered the field. And they're so good at it, and it shaped their thinking in such a way that it's hard for them to understand what they don't understand. Um, and since we're sitting in a functional convention, uh, in a functional programming convention, I assume that you're the professors in my story, and you have this gap of understanding, so I thought that we should spend some time bridging that gap. And the key to that is learning. So who is good at learning? Yes, 
everyone is good at learning, we are all developers here, and learning is a very big part of our profession. We learn all the time. We learn programming languages, we learn libraries, we learn tools, we do that all the time. Um, and it's something that we require from our job candidates, like self-learning skills. It's something that we sell to our employers, and it's part of our narrative, and it's part of our identity, knowing that we are good at learning. But I want to propose the radical notion that we may not be as good as learn at, at learning as we think. So we all studied at the university, and I want to send you back to your first year of studies. Do you remember that feeling of terror building up at the pit of your stomach, right? When on the first lesson in the semester, the professor walks into the room and fills the blackboard with definitions and equations and whatever it is that the professor did on your first day, and you couldn't understand anything. So, over time, like, courses in the university get easier and easier, and by the end of your degree, probably we're, we're probably better. And we may think that this got better because we got better at learning. But in fact, what happened was that on our first year at university, we had to learn new ways to think about problems. And by the end of our degree, what we did was apply ways to think that we already had to new problems. And learning new ways to think is an inherently harder uh, task than applying our existing way of thinking to new problems. Now, when we learn functional programming, we learn a new way to think. Okay? But in our day-to-day -day work as developers, most of the time, what we do is apply our current way to thinking, of thinking to new problems, right? So if I've been programming with object-oriented program, uh, languages all my life, learning a new uh, object-oriented language is not that different than what I did up until that point. Learning a new library is probably not that different than using a library I already know. So we really need to apply to learn new ways to think. And this is how. And what happens when we encounter that kind of task? So we said that we have experienced developers. They're supposed to be good. They're supposed to be good at learning, right? Because this is what we pay them to do. Uh, and suddenly, they encounter this learning task, which is so much harder than they've imagined. And suddenly, their identity is threatened. And they need to defend that identity. So it makes them set in their ways. They make the, it makes them set in their position. They resist changes, they resist new ideas, because these ideas are stupid, right? If you, if you can't understand this idea, it's probably stupid, it's probably not useful. Um, they feel like they're under attack. And that's not a very good emotional position to be in when you try to study. <clears throat> and this is how you get silly flame wars online. Right? When you see a flame wall online, like oh, functional programmers versus imperative programmers, which programming language is better? It's never about the programming language. It's always about people's identities. Okay? People do not, I don't know, I don't think people argue that, that much on purely, um, purely technical stuff if they don't have emotional baggage around it. So I don't go into this discussion, but I am a troll. So do you know what's the best way to troll a functional programmer? <laughs> you walk into the discussion and you tell them that it doesn't matter because all our programming languages are equivalent to a finite tape Turing machine anyway. <laughs> and then you walk away. <laughs> so, how do you build a tutorial for your company that's effective? Let's talk about it. Don't try to read it. You can't. I can't read it. I needed the graphics, so I put it here. Uh, at Hello Heart, what we did eventually was uh, we built a training program which was pretty effective. We could, in a matter of two or three weeks, take a developer who doesn't know anything about functional programming, programming and make him good enough. Were our developers experts by the time they finished this training? No. But they didn't do anything too stupid with our code, which is honestly all you can hope for at that stage. Um, and I would say that paying 
two or three weeks of uh, training time is a small price for being able to work with your favorite functional language. And I found that everything you need in order to write like a training program is a fucking spreadsheet. So how do you teach, teach stuff? I, I kind of said it a lot. Aim for good enough, right? Don't teach category theory to new developers. We talked about it. You want to be really clear about your goals. And I would argue that your goals should be efficient use, use of time, both of your time and of the trainees. Like, you don't want to spend too much time writing training pro programs, otherwise it won't happen. And you don't want them spending too much time training, otherwise people will start to complain why they're not doing real work. You want to create structure, give people feedback, and give them a sense of progress, which is really important. And you also want to create visibility so that these people's manager will be able to know what's going on. And we talked about it. This is the most important part, in my opinion. You want to establish a common knowledge, language, and understanding around software development. Ah, I lost my mouse. So how do you go about it? Right, there are so many things that you can do. You can create a course like in the company and have someone train them. You can have video lessons, like recording them. You can write material, whatever, lots of stuff. Like, this is where people usually get lost. How do I do all of this? I say, you should do none of these uh, things because you just paid a whole lot of money for your shiny new developers, right? And this is where their um, praised self-learning skills come into play. So don't sit around trying to write training materials when you can use whatever you have online. And you have everything, all the technical stuff you need online. But what do you need? You need to think about your developer's skill tree. Like, what do they need to know within two weeks in order to do the, the, the job? And then build a dependency tree, right? It's a directed uh, graph. We all know about that. So you need to build the, 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 the dependency tree between the concepts that you want them to learn. So for example, how would they go about teaching futures to new developers? I don't know, maybe I'll start with functions and higher order functions, which you need to understand in order to understand futures in Scala. And then I would go about type parameters. And then maybe I would combine these two uh, ideas and talk about monads a bit. And then talk about implicits and join the things together in order to teach futures. But I have two small comments here before I move forward. So the first one is that you shouldn't use the term monad just yet. And I'll talk about why you shouldn't do it soon. And the next one, because I know my audience and I know how much we like to argue the minutiae of our programming languages. Um, yes. I know that future is not a monad. Scala futures are not monads, but that's not the point right now, so we are not going to go into that. It's a useful concept to understand before you understand monads. Um, so once you build this tree, um, you want to set expectations. You want to talk about what's the prerequisites, which are easy to know right now, right? Because you have your skill tree. You want to talk about the rate of progress so that everyone will be aligned about how fast people should be progressing. You want, you want to be explicit about the fact that people should teach themselves. You're not going to sit around and give them lectures. They should take ownership of that. You should have exercises. This is my opinion. I believe that you can't learn programming without having exercises to guide you. And you need to talk about whose responsibility the training is. So I say that the responsibility is the, the, it's the responsibility of the trainee. Training is the responsibility of the trainee because I, as a CTO, don't want to spend too much time uh, training people, tracking people. They need to progress. They need to make sure that they progress at the rate they should be progressing. They should come to me with questions. They should come to me with feedback. And it makes the whole thing really much easier to manage and a lot less of a burden on me. So what does it look like? As I said, a fucking spreadsheet. You can't read it, don't try. Um, it's divided into sections. It's, each uh, section should take the trainee about a day. So this is how they can track their rate of progress. Um, and we have a list of subjects that the trainee should learn every day. This is where 
you take your skill tree and you flatten it. And you know how to flatten it because you know what the dependencies between the, the subjects are. So you know you can do it in a way that they will know everything they need to know. And you put it in there, divide it into days. And then you write some really simple exercises that make sure they practice the things you want them to practice. And then at the end of each day, they should take these exercises. They send them to you, send them to me. Um, I found that I had to spend about half an hour every day or two days to go over these exercises and give some, types of some type of feedback and maybe an additional hour uh, per week or per two weeks if they needed some in-depth guidance into something. Usually they didn't unless it was something really, someone really unexperienced. Um, and as I said, what you don't want to do during this uh, stage is talk about monads. And I want to talk about why that is the case. So when we teach people, what we, what we naturally want to do is take them directly to our level of understanding, right? We are woke. We know about monads. We know about category theory. We know about effects. We know all that stuff. And we want to teach them everything we know. You know, in order for them way, their way to be easier. But that's not how people learn. So the way people learn is using a slow, excruciating process that we need to take into account when we build training programs. So the first thing that they do is they see a lot of examples. And they don't understand these examples, right? They see optionals, they see lists, they see sequences, they see whatever, and they see reader and writer. And then, they learn to copy and modify and maybe use these examples without realizing what they do, which is one of the reasons why Stack Overflow, by the way, is so dangerous, because you copy a lot of stuff with them, from there without realizing what you do. But uh, that's beside the point. And then, after they work with enough examples, they finally understand the examples themselves. And only after that, which is something that happens typically a few months uh, in, into the training and we've experienced, they start to understand how the different examples relate to each other and the theory behind these examples. And this is where your monads live. And this is where people start to develop a sense of aesthetics and their own opinions about how, like their own informed opinions uh, about how things should be done and why they should be done the way they do. And you should respect that uh, process with your trainees, because if you're going to dump all that stuff, all the theory on their head on the first day in the job, they're not going to understand anything. Um, yeah, so you want to connect whatever it is they do to the real world. So in our training program, you get stuff like that, which is, OK, we took you through a series of uh, programming exercises, and now you've built a toy example of a library. Or you built a toy example of a design pattern that's used over and over in our server code. And this makes the training useful. It makes it interesting. It also makes your code um, type of training mat materials, because they can go into your code and see examples of users and how things are done. Um, you want to talk about your past mistakes. For example, the way you crashed your server code, your, your server uh, process, by getting stuff from optionals without making sure that there's something inside. Um, I'd say that you should also make people fail the way, you, the way you failed, so that they will understand why you do things the way you do, uh, so that they will feel the pain, uh, so to speak. And use your experience, use your code as a didactic tool. You want to pass your values, right? I love me some compiler, and I talk about it all the time. So the subject of using your compiler to help you uh, to detect uh, problems in your code, why we use it, how we use it, is repeated all over the training program. And the key here is repetition, right? You, you hear it at the beginning. Pay attention to how you use the compiler. Um, you pay attention to uh, functions type, you pay attention to the way certain constructs are used to verify the program's correctness. And you want to tie everything together. Like I said, these concepts relate to each other. You want to talk about it in your training program. 
And that's the kind of stuff that goes into the last column of our uh, training. So this is the, the part of the, the comment part, uh, section, the, uh, let's call it meta training. This is the important stuff that you're supposed to learn and that you're not going to get anywhere else. Um, you want to invest time in the important stuff. So uh, we believe in testing. So when you train uh, in Hello Heart, you spend the whole day writing tests out of two days of uh, two weeks of uh, training because this is important and we signal this uh, thing's importance by spending time on it. And finally, um, again, last but not least, we like to go a little silly and tell people that we know learning can be hard and that it can be tough and that it's going to suck. And I find that, you know, not many people, not many experienced people will tell you that, but even the most hardened developer, I think, appreciates uh, being told that it's okay to take some time and study and go through this thing and not be excellent, like know everything on their first time on the job. And I'm telling you this as well, right? I'm telling you that you can have your cake and keep it whole. You can have your functional programming languages and your hiring. As long as you invest some time in thinking about how you're going to handle your onboarding, onboarding with new developers. So if you're curious, um, you can see Hello Heart's Scala training online. Um, we can argue about whether it's the, you know, whether it contains all the subjects that needed for a functional programmer. I know some people who would say no, uh, sitting here in this crowd. Um, and, but you can look at the approach and maybe you can extract something useful from it. The, yeah, it's too small. I see you squinting. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I just went to the spot of learning half code from pair programming. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed about uh, the functional, functional paradigm that is different than learning other things, which is it requires a little bit more depth of thinking. You can't, you can't just attack it sufficiently, but you can't put anything else on us and learn it. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, do you accentuate that? How do you get even experienced programmers to? You know, dive in deeper in order to be able to have a better understanding. And in terms of that school of functional programming, you have, you have to do that. There's no, there's no other way. You have to go one step deeper. Yeah, so for me, I think the thing is you have to break down things and really take people through them gradually. Right, so we talk about the concept of function. This is simple. Talk about the, the, the concept of a function's type. This is simple. Uh, you talk about how you construct things from functions. This is simple. And then, if you and then you you have them practice each one of these steps, right? So you write things using uh, functions. Then you use them to abstract computations that you would normally do in other programming languages. And then you talk about okay, now this is this is this is this is the way you abstract stuff. Let's see how you use these ab abstractions. Um, it's all about breaking things into little parts, explaining these things, and then putting them to get together and explaining why you put them together that way. Uh, if you have like specific subjects that you think you, you want to ask about, we can do it later. We can try to break them down together. Yes? Is training something that ends after a few weeks, or do you expect your program to keep on learning and so, facilitate that in any way? This is a great, great question. The question was whether training ends in two weeks. Uh, I expect my developers to learn all the time. Okay, I expect them to learn, I expect them to know more than me. I expect them to come to me after a while with ideas, new ideas, stuff they, that we should do, ways to, to implement uh, uh, better processes, technologies, whatever. Um, in my view, the initial training should give you just enough knowledge to, to do like your first production tasks without making any mess. And it should give you tools to continue your learning. So one of the things that was hardest for me with Scala um, was the fact that, you know, people who write Scala code, they really like to write domain-specific languages. 
Okay, it's all the rage. And you use libraries, and each library has its own domain-specific language, and they all look like the language, like, like native language constructs, because this is how Scala was written. And then you sit in front of this code, and you cannot understand which part of the code you're reading, uh, Scala language or domain-specific language that someone wrote. So what we did in our training, for example, was talk about how uh, the uh, about which tools the language give you to write domain specific language and how you can identify constructs that are native to the language and those that are uh, domain specific languages why people do it and how you can find out what stuff does so what we did was give people tools that they can use later on to investigate other people's codes and other people um, other people's um, libraries and I like to encourage people also to dig into other people's code and libraries because I think this is one of the best way to, ways to learn. And they do it all the time. And then, you know, when they, when they approach a new concept that they cannot understand on their own, usually they bring it back to me during code reviews or something like that, and, and, and we break it down and understand it together. But they are expected to continue learning all the time. Did I answer your question? I wanted to know how you facilitate that, how you build the culture that allows that, are you sick of time, are you sick of people, it's okay to learn? Uh, so this is this is really a, a management question. How you facilitate that? They always have training uh, materials materials available. Uh, they can purchase courses if they want. If they feel like it, they can purchase them online. They can order their books. Uh, they can request time to sit and learn every day if they want to, and they are encouraged to do that. I think that you know um, it's the way it's it's around the way you communicate with people and the tools you give them. Um, if you if if you talk to if someone tells you, okay, I spent some time reading this article about this concept, and you tell them why didn't you spend this time completing your task, then you are sending a message that completing your task is more important than learning. But if you tell them, if they come to you with a question and you tell them, okay, go online and investigate this subject, maybe even, you know, explain it to the other team members if they don't know, and do a lecture or something like that, you are sending a signal that training is important and that it has a part in your culture. Anyone else? Yes? Uh, how do you create that single within uh, experienced developers that are already have like, a few years inside the company? You want them to, uh, to, to start learning again? Uh, this is a good question. How you encourage in, um, experienced programmers? I like, you know, so if, if you have someone who is not, is completely not interested in anything, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't instill uh, motivation in someone by force. But I find that often if you give people responsibilities, if you give them projects, uh, if you let them teach other people, if they have other people looking up to them, it really motivates them to get better themselves. So this is one way of doing it. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.